This video is brought to you by Holocasa. Our tool transforms independent local real estate agents to global real estate agents. Create your own profile for free and get contacted by international investors. Sign up with the link in the description. Hello and welcome everyone to our 124th session of Holocasa. My name is Michael and today I'm talking to Shannon Rocknett from Boise, Idaho. Shannon has been in the real estate industry for over 25 years and is the founder of Shannon Rocknett's Industries, a leading real estate developer and syndicator with five generations of real estate professionals and expertise. Shannon Rocknett's Industries specializes in the acquisition of development land and entitling it. And once ready for construction, they involve their syndication partners in the actual real estate. So you could actually, one of the syndication partners, uh, you, the person listening to this show. Um, Shannon, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, thank you so much. You're the first person from Boise, Idaho. I looked it up before. I think it looks like a very pleasant and nice city to live in. Um, yeah. Why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Thank you, Michael. I appreciate you uh, having me on the show. You know, <clears throat> I've been here in the Treasure Valley, which is uh, the surrounding area of Boise, for uh, almost 43 years and have enjoyed growing up here. It's a it's a small city. It's uh, it's outgrown the large town. It's now a small city. But um, I'm a I'm I'm second generation in the development and construction game. And my mother was a third generation real estate broker. So I grew up in that. And I've been uh, I've done everything from moving houses to, uh, you know, building single family homes, building hospitals, um, storage facilities, uh, medical, police stations, all that. I, I, I built everything. And I kept figuring out that once I was done building it, uh, the people that I built it for got to collect the rents and they got to make the money. And so over the last two decades, I've worked hard to change that and have created uh, Shannon Robinette Industries out of that. So, uh, but again, Michael, it's a pleasure. Um, amazing. Let's start from the beginning. Um, you grew up in a real estate um, family, but you doesn't mean that you didn't necessarily need to work in real estate. So you were in high school and in college, maybe. Uh, when was the situation when you um, said, okay, honestly, like this makes sense. I have it in my blood. I uh, know actually more than people who try when they're in their 50s and jump into real estate. So why actually not giving it a shot? And how was that? Well, it's almost like you uh, read my mind because I did. I tried to go to college. I wanted to be uh, in 1992, the big thing was computer information systems. You know, the internet was just coming out. All those things were just happening. And I was going to go to college and be one of those smart guys. Uh, but I was watching as my brother was building houses uh, in 93, and he made about $45,000 in 1993, right out of high school with no degree. And I was paying somebody. I was doing homework. I was working at a coffee shop, trying to pay my insurance for my car. And I just thought, this doesn't make any sense. My, I, I've got all the training I could ever want right here at my fingertips with mentors like my mom and my dad. And my brother's making, you know, the starting salary that I'll make in four years. Uh, why would I keep doing this? And so you're, you're right, Michael. I, I took a real quick look at that, exited college and uh, began, uh, began my journey in real estate. And, um, uh, you know, here we are 28 years later. I'm always very interested in the first steps, the small nitty gritty um, parts of that. How was that? How did you really like start? Did you just say, okay, let me work with you, mother, or let me uh, work with your brother? Um, how was that? You know, I, I think I might have said something like that, but my dad told me, I, I said, you know, I want to build houses like my brother, Mike, who's my younger brother. And my dad said, great, let's go get the tractor. And I go, well, what do we need the tractor for? And he goes, well, you have to dig the foundation. And I said, no, we can just call a guy and he could dig the foundation. And my dad looked at me and he says, but how do you know if he dug it wrong? And how do you know how to fix it if you haven't done it? And back when we were building houses, Michael, we would, it would take about three months to build a house and you would dig the foundation and you would put all the utilities in, the sewer, the water, the power, all of that. You would prep all of the patios and the sidewalks for the concrete. And then the foundation guys would come in and pour all the concrete. And then there was two other guys that my brother shared with me. He and I traded these two framers back and forth. And then you would physically frame the house. <clears throat> and then when the electricians, the plumbers, the heating and air guys came in and did all their work, you went into the shop and you built a set of cabinets. And then you stained and lacquered all the doors. And so then you would come in after it was sheetrocked, you would paint it inside and out. 
and that was a weekend. You'd paint the inside one day and the outside the next. And then you'd hang all the doors and you'd install all the cabinets and you'd call the lady to come do the countertops. And then the carpet guy would come in <clears throat> and that was how you do it, did it. And you could build a house like that uh, in three to four months. And then you would wait for that house to sell. And then when that house sold, you would start another one. And so it was a very hands-on process. And I remember the, the second house I did, we framed the window in the wrong spot. It We didn't frame it per the plans. And I went and built the cabinets off the plans and one of my cabinets was wrong. And so I had to rebuild the whole cabinet or tear the window out and move the window. I, I wound up rebuilding the cabinet. But I remember that that was what my dad used as lessons for me to learn that you measure twice. You measure when you frame the, the wall and then you measure when you before you build your cabinets to verify that what you're going to build is accurate and it's going to fit. And it was lessons like that that showed me early on that you can build a team to do a lot of these things. But if you don't understand how to do it yourself, you can never make the team very big because you can never solve the problem. What was the feeling of creating your own house? The very begin, the very first one, was that uh, something special? <clears throat> You know, it it was. In fact, I was. I just drove by it. Uh, it's on the way to uh, a project that we're doing now, which is a 60-unit apartment complex. It's about two miles down the road. And I swung into the subdivision and I looked at it. And, you know, that house, I built that house in 1995. So here it is, uh, almost 30 years old, right? And I looked at the house and I was just kind of nostalgic, I guess. But it does bring a sense of satisfaction when you're able to look at what you actually physically built. You know, I framed that house. Uh, I painted that house. You know, I built the cabinets in that house. I had a lot to do with that house and how it looks. Fast forward now, how many of those or how many houses have you created so far? Have you counted? Well, I only created about seven houses. And then I realized that I didn't like homeowners, right? They were too picky. They were always complaining, you know, and, and that's when I really transitioned my business into commercial where I did, you know, police stations and office buildings and industrial warehouses because business owners really, they, they didn't care about the nick in the wall. They wanted to get the building open so they could put their employees in there and they could make money. So it was a very different clientele with a very different process. And I really appreciated that process a lot more. I guess there's also more return on investment because for the same land, you can, um, I don't know, if you get a supermarket or uh, anything mm -hmm. like that, uh, you might make more money on it. Is that a right assumption or is it more or less the same? Well, <clears throat> the reality is the percentage, all of our fees are usually calculated on a percentage. And so my brother still builds custom homes and he builds amazing houses. Um, he, I mean, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're very expensive houses and he charges the same fee that I do. And so when he's building a $3 million home, that's the same as me building a $3 million office building, but I'm going to have my office building done in 12 months. And he's going to be two years building a $3 million home, right? It's just, it comes down more to what do you like to do? My brother loves detail. He's an incredible craftsman. And so he really enjoys creating masterpieces that bring your idea to life as far as where you want to live. We jumped directly into your business. I would like to um, ask you to give us a quick overview of uh, Boise uh, and uh, Idaho for the international audience who uh, might not have been uh, to this to the city. Yeah. Well, you know, we are <clears throat> we're about 850,000 people, so it's not large. Uh we're about uh five hours from Salt Lake City. We're about eight hours from Seattle. So we're right in the Pacific Northwest. But the thing that I love most about Boise is that in 45 minutes, I can be on the ski hill or in a lake. I can be on the river floating, uh, you know, fishing right in my backyard. Literally through the heart of the city is a beautiful river. Uh, there's a ton, there's a lot of recreational activities in the area. And it's a very It's a very outdoorsy space. Everybody here rides bikes or motorcycles or camps or hunts or fishes. It's just a very, very, um, very great place. And it's low crime, good schools. And so it's a, it's really has a lot of a community feel to it. Perfect. 
If you um, can now give me an overview regarding neighborhoods in terms of real estate um, in Boise, because most of your activities is um, is in Boise, so um, so that also the audience understands a little bit like how it's structured, commercial versus residential, maybe up and coming, trendy, um, saturated neighborhoods. Um, can you give us an overview there? Yeah. We're a very low density area, a lot of single family homes. In fact, when I was going to high school, if you lived in an apartment complex, it means that your parents had bad credit because if you, if your parents were normal, they owned a house, three bedrooms, two bath, you know, half acre. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of open space. There's a lot of, you know, we don't have a lot of apartment buildings that's come in the last 15 years. And so there's not a lot of density in the Treasure Valley, 850,000 people is spread out over about 50 miles. So even that is not very dense. And that's another part that makes it very nice is it's uh, it's 85% neighborhoods, right? The downtown core is maybe two kilometers squared, maybe three, not very big at all. Uh, and everything else is just neighborhoods. It's, you know, the tree line streets and everything that you would picture. Uh, and it's just a very, uh, very, very user friendly. It, it, it doesn't feel like a city, you know, it feels like you're on a movie set half the time because it's, you know, houses and, and, you know, then you have the shopping centers in, in one area and, and then more houses around them. Very interesting. Um, regarding your, your business right now, you have uh, very impressive numbers on your website. Uh, one of them is, uh, average return on investment is 25%. Um, how do you achieve this humongous return on investment? Well, I, you know, I, I think that that comes with, with experience, right? Uh, I mean, I have been doing this for 27 years and I've, I've made a lot of mistakes in the past and I've learned from those mistakes and we've built a better machine. Um, but, you know, we've had, uh, spectacular triple digit returns on stuff. And we've had, you know, uh, so we, we, we look at all of that and we, we look at every single deal is how is this deal going to go wrong? Right. And we try to build in the scenarios that keep us from it going wrong, keep it from going bad. Um, and, and the reality is if you put enough plan B's and C's and D's and E's into a deal, then you're not going to buy every single deal that comes across your desk. But the ones you do buy are going to be good deals that are going to be lucrative, that are going to provide protection uh, and profits for your partners. That being said, um, what is your portfolio? What does it look like? Because you have so much assets under management and you have raised so much of capital. Um, basically, if you could um, say, okay, probably most of it is commercial use, you just mentioned but how can I imagine the portfolio to also get an understanding of, uh, to see like where are the gold nuggets? Yeah. Well, most of them are, I mean, I think all of our portfolio is in commercial. Uh, we own uh, a small portion of office. Uh, we have a lot of industrial warehouses because industrial warehouses are fairly recession proof uh, and they're definitely inflation proof because the warehouse lease puts all of the expenses as a, as a cost to the tenant. So if your property taxes go up, it doesn't affect the landlord, it affects the tenant. When your insurance goes up, it affects the tenant, not the landlord. And then you have quality tenants in there that usually have a balance sheet, they, they, they run a business, they have employees, they're business minded, and they will sign a personal guarantee, which does better than a tenant in a multifamily. That being said, they don't generate the most spectacular returns, but they generate the most consistent returns. So then we have multifamily in there as well. Uh, we've got a, uh, two projects going right now, uh, about uh, $95 million between the two. And then we have two more on the boards for next year. That'll be another $100, $110 million combined. And so when we look at those, those provide uh, in certain markets, provide great returns and other markets they can like now they can be, you know, not doing as well. But when we're building new product, new new things always cost more. And so we're dealing with the top tier of tenants. We're dealing with the professionals. We're dealing with the lawyers, the doctors, the people that are just moving to town that want to find a place to live for a year while they figure out how everything looks and works. And so we tend to have a better class of tenancy that really 
uh, uh, does well for our portfolio and our investors. You just mentioned the keyword investors. Um, for someone who is interested in being part and also investing along you, um, you allow that? It's not close Absolutely. to to, uh, to anyone, uh, um, to a certain audience. How does that work? What do I have to do in order to um, reach out? To, um, what's the process like if I say, okay, that sounds like actually like a very interesting thing. I always wanted to jump into real estate. Um, let me let me ring up uh, Shannon. Well, you know, the the easiest place to go is to our website, shannonrobnet.com. And there you can see the products that we're building. You can see uh, the offerings that we have. You can also get to my calendar and we can have a phone call and talk about it. Because, Michael, the number one thing that I want to provide to people is the education. I want them to understand what they're investing in. I think the biggest problem that people have is they invest in things that they don't fully understand and when they don't fully understand it, it it either gets them into something that they wouldn't have done if they fully understood it, or it keeps them from feeling completely comfortable with the investment. And we really want to educate to the point that you totally understand what you're doing, you're comfortable with it, you understand the market, you understand the product, so that when we're doing this process and we're building it and we're and we're filling it with tenants and we're doing all that we do, there's an ease and an and a and a understanding that we're doing the right thing and you can feel good about it as well. And that's really the number one thing that I want. If anybody wants, has questions or things like that, please just reach out at shannonrobnet.com. How um, is there a certain, let's say you just mentioned before how I call that you have a new fund, which is yeah. op still opened. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have certain conditions which always apply for the same investor and um if not how does it basically how is it always structured or do you always create like new um basically like new products or new new conditions based on a person who might be willing to invest 300k versus 3 million how does that work you know <clears throat> i don't do special conditions i okay. i think that I, i think to me it's very important to treat everyone the same but The, the other reason behind that, Michael, is the accounting is a nightmare, right? And what I want is I want to create an investor experience that gives everybody an equal footing. The guy that has $3 million, he is important. But in my opinion, he's no more important than the guy that has $100,000. Uh, he got his $3 million, however he did. But, you know, hopefully with the right strategies, the guy that has $100,000 can turn it into $3 million. But the fund is very simple because it it allows you versatility. You can come and go in the fund as you want after a period of one year. So you're not tied up like a lot of real estate deals where you're in it for five years or seven years or whatever. You know, you invest the money, something happens, you need to you need to change directions or you need to pull the money out. You're able to do that and it and it's fairly seamless and it can happen. Makes total sense. Um now talking a little bit about the process how that works um, i assume that me as a potential co-investor or a syndic um, or a person who is part of the syndicate i would sign a contract and then i would then return also or get a return after a certain uh, couple of months um, or years because this project might need first to be constructed what is basically like the conditions i'm i can expect You know, so with the fund, uh, we are typically in the lending process on that, right? So we're involved in that. So we do quarterly returns. So every three months, you'd be getting money back. Uh, you'd be getting your interest on the project and the and the things like that. And we have all of our documents are vetted and run through attorneys, and they're all filed with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, because we want to make sure that everything we do is legal and above board. And so if you got involved in that, there would be probably 140 pages of legalese for you to read through. Uh, it's not very fun, but it's necessary to spill out all the terms and conditions, but they're really simple. They're really simple. Uh, we will do our best in our fiduciary duty to get the highest rate of return for you. And, and the agreement is that for at least 366 days, you are going to leave your money in the fund. After that, If you don't like the performance, you can send us a notice and we'll send you your money back with all of your interest and all of the uh, 
the profits that you made while you were in the fund. Makes total sense. I would like to go back a little bit to the process of constructing, or first of all, identifying the land, uh, buying the land, getting also especially like licenses to, for construction, mm -hmm. and then, um, yeah, fulfilling the construction and also finding a tenant. Yeah. What start? Where do you start? Do you start with a potential tenant? Do you do market research on okay, this might be a very interesting um, location for a gas station? Um, do you check even the soil? How can I imagine this process? Yeah. So the first thing we do is we start with the end in mind. So we look at the market, right? Because as you know, there are certain towns that are good. And there are certain towns that aren't good. There are certain towns that are growing very quickly, and there are certain towns that are actually losing residents. And so we look at the market first because the market will be the biggest determining factor of your success. And then when we look at that market, we decide what does that market need the most? And where is the largest profit margin for ourselves and our investors? Because some markets, let's say that the average income in that market is only $40,000. It's very hard for a a person that's making $40,000 to pay $2,000 in rent. But I really need $2,000 in rent if I'm going to build a brand new apartment complex. But those people usually have industrial type jobs. It's a very working class market. So they would need warehouse space. So if we identify a market like Houston, Texas, we like that market, but we don't like it for multifamily. We like it for industrial. So after we've identified the market, then we've identified our product, then we go looking for a location that would be good for that product. And once we find that location, we put it under contract and we have uh, usually 60 days to do our due diligence. So we talk with the city and make sure we can get the licenses. We talk with the engineers and we make sure the soil is good and that the sewer is available and the water and do all of our due diligence. And if there's any... Uh, special licenses that take six, nine, 10 months to get, then we go back to the owner and we adjust the contract to give us that time because I don't ever want to buy a piece of property without knowing that I can do what I did or what I want to do with the property. I never want to own the land without knowing what I'm going to do. And then once I've determined that this is the right place, this is the right location, and it's going to be uh, you know, multifamily, then I will reach out to property managers and find out what amenities people want, what kind of people are wanting to rent these apartments in this location, and really understand who my tenant is going to be, and then divide, uh, devise my budget to make sure that that tenant is going to get the experience that they want for the kind of rent they're willing to pay. And then from there, we go about building the buildings, and then the tenants naturally tend to gravitate towards that, and we hire the property management company and all of those things. It's very interesting. Maybe you should actually get getting paid by the mayor and the municipality as well because <laughs> you're doing that job, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I wish it was that way, but we turn around and we pay them because when we build the streets and all the sewer, then we, we give all that to them, right? We have to, uh, through an easement, we give all of that to them and then we pay taxes on what we just created for their city. <laughs> <laughs> At least, like maybe you get like a um, like a um, how do you um, how do you call it in, in English? I forgot the name, but maybe you get an award. Exactly, you should yeah, get at least yeah. like an award as a special yeah. special citizen for for yeah. this uh, for the city. Um, starting though with the part of the social, I call it like social economic data in the end. Like it, it mm -hmm. sounds like you really run some uh, Excel Excel sheets and uh, go mm -hmm. on to on I don't know so certain data sources and see okay what's yeah. actually like. Do we have influx? Do we have outflux of uh, population? Do we have uh, rather um, people in working as you said like blue color workers, uh, white yep. color workers? Um, where do we see how how young or how old is the is the town? Um, is that very quantitative? Is that mainly quantitative data? Obviously, yeah. coupled with also with your shoe leather costs on on being around and uh, knowing the entire city in and out. But how do you approach this entire topic? Well, I mean, you know, we're we have deals from Washington State to Florida, right? So just because I'm headquartered in Boise doesn't mean that's the only place we develop. And so you're exactly right, Michael. We take all the known data available, all of the per capita income, and we look at the tax rates. We look at uh, what what services are there. We look at who the employers are. 
we want to know uh, what kind of industry supplies this talent, right? Because once we know really the economics behind the town, then it helps us to understand how we can benefit by being of use to the town, right? Because if I build a if I build a really beautiful with marble everywhere and fountains and all this stuff, I build this really great place that costs, you know, $80 million, but the people can only afford $1,500 rents, then I'm going to go out of business. And vice versa, if I create this really basic place, but everybody there is pretty bougie, they're all driving BMWs and working in you know the tech field, they're not going to want to live there either. And so you have to do all of that before you ever put the shoe leather down. But then once you know that this is a town you want to be in, you've got to get in there and you've got to walk the streets and you've got to find out where everybody's at. you got to find out that this is a drivable location. It's well connected to bus services, to trams, everything like that so that you can know that you're getting your value out of the land. You know, the land is a very small portion. It's less than 10% of the cost of a development, but it can determine, location can determine 35 to 40% of the demand. It's very interesting. I uh, lately talked to um, Helena from uh, Barcelona, and she mentioned a lot the micro um, neighborhoods. So, you know, mm -hmm. Because right now I feel like okay, you say you just mentioned from Washington DC, uh, from Washington State down to Florida, it can be anywhere. And in the end, like for you to determine, okay, this city might be interesting because this is basically the um, audience we are looking for. We have been serving in different uh, cities. Uh, we know the product, and now let's go and not only like pinpoint one certain random location but let's go and deep dive a little bit further down a certain neighborhood and then inside that neighborhood see okay actually there is a very nice white white space regarding an offering we have done in different cities is that sort of like the approach that's exactly that's exactly what we do you know i mean think of it like an airplane right you're flying over at 30,000 feet at 500 miles an hour and you identify something so you get in a helicopter and you hover around You know, and then when you get closer, you get a drone and you get into the neighborhood, right? And you're very, very specific. And then you hit the street, right? But I guarantee you, everything that we look at has all been looked at from Google Maps. It's been looked at from the analytics and from the data because data drives decisions. Data is not emotional. Data just makes black and white decision of this is a good thing. This is not a good thing. This should work, you know, and then you okay. have funny little things like COVID or whatever else happens that changes all the data, right? Yeah, makes total sense. And I assume you also uh, augment this uh, big data with obviously talking to neighbors, talking to people around to really also get yeah. like a uh, sort of a feeling of that entire town. Um, Absolutely. Talking to the entire institutions, I guess like this would be like the biggest um challenge for me i think like it, it sounds always like the, the biggest challenge to talk to the institutions and the mayor and uh, the organizations regarding the licenses because they have a reputation of being slow and just creating problems how is that especially like always going after new ones because it's not like you just mentioned it's not only boise idaho so it's like hey you're knocking on the doors like hey who are you yeah i'm a random guy coming from boise idaho i want to buy this land and i want to constru uh, construct a supermarket on it may i how does that work well you know and and that's where your data helps you right michael so when we show up we have data that shows what the community needs right And so when we can show that your community needs this, we've invested in the research that shows that you guys could use some more of these. And then you meet with the mayor, you meet with uh, the planning and zoning director, you've researched their code that they have online that says, this is how we want to grow. This is what we want to do. And you paint them a picture of being helpful, right? When I was a younger guy, I used to go in there and, and just kind of, hey, I'm here, let me in, I'm going to build what I want right? I own the land. I can do whatever I want, right? And that attitude didn't get me very far as you can imagine. But when you go in there and you ask, how can I help the city grow? These are the things that I would like to bring to the city that it doesn't currently have or that it has some of and it needs more of. And, and then you become viewed as a different kind of person. In fact, after building a couple of projects in a certain city, we were invited by the mayor to build another project because she really liked what we were doing 
and loved how we were enhancing the city instead of just looking at it to be profiteers and sell the soul of the city for brick and concrete. That's a nice one. Okay. Really interesting. Um, and also really interesting on your entire approach. Um, Shannon, I know your time is limited uh, and I know that you, um, that you are running after so many projects and that you have a, like a large, large team. I, so far I've, I've, um, and I hope we're gonna, we're gonna talk soon again, but for this yeah. time, I, I learned a lot of things. You gave us a very nice introduction about Boise, Idaho. Um, you really gave me a very interesting feeling on how the first step was for you to jump into real estate uh, and making, I think, a very wise decision being uh, making money in your 20s instead of uh, paying money and then being uh, with a student loan uh, caught up uh, with uh, right. I don't know, beginning 30s uh, and wondering what should I do in my life with. Um, you also gave us very interesting details on how the entire uh, process works. Um, I really learned a lot regarding the entire process of um, making the analysis, getting the information, buying the land, and then also going to closure. Um, I would like to give you the words to share with us something which we might not have touched upon and you would like to share to the audience. You know, I think that, Michael, it's podcasts like yours that are bringing people information. And, you know, I see that a lot of times people don't have enough information to make decisions or they make poor decisions because they don't get the right information. But I would encourage everyone, you know, if you'll take the time to learn, you can do anything. And once you've learned how to do it, you have to put it into action. And if you put it into action, I can guarantee you, you're not going to want for things. You'll be able to create the life you want that's in alignment with what your actions are. And so I want to say thank you to you for putting out podcasts like this that give information, that help people get educated, that help them understand that there is all the things in life that they want, they can have if they actually work toward getting them and getting the knowledge to understand how to get them quickly. Perfect. I love that final those final words. Thank you so much for your for your time and thank you so much for sharing these these insights. How can people reach out to you apart from uh, the website which you mentioned? Is there any other way? You know, you can reach me. I'm on all the social channels, so you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of that. But the easiest way to get connected with all of that information is through shannonrobnet.com and you can get to all my social handles there. Or you can just hit info at and ask your questions and or get to my calendar and let's book a call. Perfect. I will share your contact information in the show notes so that people can directly reach out to you. Shannon, awesome. it's been a pleasure. I'm sending the best regards to Boise, Idaho. I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. This video is brought to you by Alucasa. Our tool transforms independent local real estate agents to global real estate agents. Create your own profile for free and get contacted by international investors. Sign up with the link in the description.